got a Bible, let's go back to uh, Ephesians chapter 5. And uh, kind of getting near the end of this section uh, in, in talking about marriage, Jesus and my marriage. But uh, if you remember last week, I told you that it was like one message in two parts. So the idea today is to finish what we started uh, last week, okay? So I actually want to start with, uh, with a little cartoon, okay, to, to set this up uh, this way. So you can see this, the wife is holding her husband on her shoulders. She says, if you, I think everybody can read it, but just in case you can't, Willard, I'm starting to question your interpretation of those passages about submission, and so some of you may be questioning my interpretation of this passage. Uh, you may question like if uh, the Bible is even true, uh, you know, when it talks about uh, stuff like this, and that's certainly common. I mean, what we're going to talk about today is, is rejected by culture. It's considered oppressive, maybe abusive by, by many people. And there is a segment of the church that uh, tends to redefine uh, this concept. And so, I just want to say just a little something up front, though, is if you hear the Bible saying, uh, you know, submit to your husband and read that as like oppressive or mean towards women or something like that, I can pretty much guarantee you that any first century woman in Ephesus who read this passage would not have found this to be mean or oppressive. Uh, she would have found this to be radically liberating. Uh, people's minds would have been blown by this. Because if you read ancient literature, uh, from what scholars say in, in, in Greco-Roman literature, you're not going to find commands for husbands to love their wives. It's going to be very limited even in, in Jewish uh, literature, in actuality. And, and so... Uh, you know, this whole passage would have been really radical in a more positive way uh, than a negative way. Uh, you know, in, in Roman culture, uh, there was something called paterfamilias, where, you know, the father had absolute authority over the family, even uh, to the point of being able to determine whether or not a child, after it was born, could live or die. They practiced infanticide to a, to a degree, and in actuality, it, it was more common with female babies than it was male babies that they would be abandoned or killed in, in, in some way. Um, in, in his book, What If Jesus Had Never Been Born? Dr. G, D. James Kennedy talked about, he said this, prior to Christian influence, a woman's life was very cheap. In ancient cultures, the wife was the property of her husband. Uh, in, in places like India, China, Rome, and Greece, people felt and declared that women were not able or competent to be uh, independent. Aristotle said that a woman was somewhere between a free man and a slave. And when we understand how valueless a slave was in ancient times, we get a glimpse of how bad a woman's fate was uh, back then. I mean, if you study other societies through the years, you know, in, in India, there's been the practice of like a man dies, his widow is supposed to be burned on a funeral uh, pyre. Uh, other uh, cultures have practiced uh, similar things. Think about the mistreatment of uh, women in the fundamentalist Muslim uh, world. And the reality is, uh, is this. Uh, he concludes this section, Kennedy does, by saying this. He says, How ironic that feminists today do not give any credit to Christ or Christianity. In fact, they say it has oppressed women. And what he's saying is, when you look at the historical facts, uh, that's actually the opposite is true. And he says this. He says, In reality, Gloria Steinem, had she survived childhood, might very well be wearing a veil today apart from Christian influence. And so, as we read this, I just want us to keep that in mind and understand that there is a different factual historical narrative than the cultural narrative that we hear today as we discuss this subject. So, as I kind of said up front, uh, let's read part of this passage again. I'm going to read Ephesians 5, 21 through 24. And then I'm going to do just uh, do some review from last week, because remember what I said, it's one message, two parts, and then we're going to look at more of the ladies' side 
uh, of it. But, but some of what I'm going to be saying, it's like similar to last week, it's just kind of a different angle. Last week was the husband's angle. This week is, is the wife's angle. So uh, Paul says here, Ephesians 5.21, submitting to one another in the fear of God. Wives, submit to your own husbands. And, and there's an emphasis there, to your own husbands, not men in general, uh, as to the Lord. For the husband is head of the wife, as also Christ is head of the church, and he is the Savior of the body. Therefore, just as the church is subject to Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. Okay? So, just to kind of review a little bit from, from last week, remember, really from the last few weeks, the, the big picture, the, the main idea of this entire passage is the, the relationship between Christ and the church and the analogy of a husband and a wife in marriage and how they represent that. And we've talked about how uh, uh, you know, Christian marriage is designed to be a picture of the gospel. It's designed to be empowered by the gospel. And so what these commands that he's giving here are ultimately based on the relationship of Jesus to his church and the church to Jesus. And so I shared a quote about this from Dr. Danny Aiken last week. I want to read part of that quote again. It'll be on the screen. So he says, from its very founding, the institution of marriage was designed to image forth the relationship that Jesus Christ has with the people of God, the church. The man leads, loves, and serves his wife because that is how Christ gives himself to his bride. And the wife respects, submits to, and helps her husband because that is how the church of God follows the risen Lord Jesus. So this was not a cultural accommodation. This is based on this relationship of Christ to the church and the church to Christ. Everything that he's saying here, that is what it's about. So the main idea that I shared last week, and we kind of unpacked the first part of it, going to unpack the second part of it today, is this. The husband's position is headship. The husband is head of the wife. So his role is leadership. And the wife's role is to follow her husband's leadership through submission. Now, let's review just a little bit on, on the husband's side of it. And then uh, we'll, we'll focus on the second half of that. So, the husband's position is headship. So his role is leadership. So uh, this means, you know, what we talked about for the last few weeks. This leadership is rooted or expressed in the context of loving his wife like Christ loves the church and him then being one with her. So men, everything we do in marriage, including our leadership, but every part of our marriage is guided by the fact that uh, we're to love our wives with an unconditional love, with a sacrificial uh, love, with a... Uh, sanctifying love, a love that's helping her grow spiritually with a caring love and with a permanent love. So our leadership is rooted in love. Uh, it's to be Christ-like leadership, which is servant leadership. And we talked about last week the fact that Jesus, um, who had every right as God, laid down all of his rights to come and take responsibility for our sin and so what that means then is Christ-like servant leadership is laying down our rights and then taking up the responsibility for our wife and family to lead them in a godly, loving way. And that the ultimate purpose of, of this leadership is to lead our families in doing the will of God. Now, let me, let me give an illustration of this, and then we'll move on uh, to the wife uh, side of it. And I want to give this illustration because I, I think it's really helpful. It's kind of an overview. I understand, you know, everybody wasn't here last week and didn't hear the first part of it. And, and I think the way to read this text is, is to read the, the wife's part of it is in the light of what God is saying to the husband. So this comes from Andy Stanley. Uh, a lot of you listened to him preach before, <clears throat> pastor in the Atlanta area. It comes from one of his books. He says, when I was 26, I flew to Washington, D.C. to be a groomsman in a friend's wedding. Uh, after the reception, the wedding party of 12 or so headed to an upscale bar in Georgetown. Being part of the wedding party, I tagged along. Uh, at some point uh, during the conversation, there was a girl uh, who uh, was like he was sitting next to her 
and uh, he said, and he says he's quoting here, Andy, I heard a preacher say that the man has to be the head of the home because a two-headed home is like a two-headed monster. Is that what you believe, that the man is to be the head? And so he, he says, here's the gist of what I said, which was directed at the girls who were asking the questions. So before I answer your question, imagine you're married to a man who genuinely believes you're the most fantastic person on the planet. He's crazy about you. You have no doubt that your happiness is his top priority. He listens when you talk. He honors you in public. To use an old-fashioned term, he cherishes you. He's not afraid to make a decision. He values your opinions. He leads, but he listens. He's responsible. He's not argumentative. You have no doubt that he would give his life for you if the need arose. You never have to worry about him being unfaithful. In fact, to quote an old Flamingo song, he has eyes only for you. As I was saying all of this, the folks on the other end of the table tuned in and began to listen. The longer I talked, the more I sensed their resistance ebbing. When I finished, I paused and asked, would either of you have trouble following a man like that? The girl to my right blurted out, well, bad language bleeped out, no, I want to meet that guy. Everybody laughed. Without realizing it, she made my point. It's easy, perhaps natural, to submit to someone who genuinely has your best interest in mind. There's no fear, no reason to resist. Conversely, anyone who has your best interest in mind has, in effect, submitted to you. That person has chosen to leverage him or herself for your benefit, basically saying, you first. And I don't know that I know a better way uh, to summarize what this text is saying to us men. Now, let's go to the second part of it and uh, talk to the ladies. The guys are like, he's beating up on me enough, uh, so <laughs> it's your turn now, honey. You might not want to say that to her, though. Um, <laughs> So the wife's role is to follow her husband's leadership through submission. Now, what does that look like? Well, uh, I want to remind us a couple of things we talked about uh, last week. First of all, husbands and wives are equal persons with different roles. His role is leadership. Hers is voluntary submission. So the Bible is very, very clear that men and women are equal on the same plane, same level in, in the sight of God. You know, Genesis 1.27 says, Male and female were created in the image of God. Uh, Genesis 2.18, The Lord God said to Adam, It is not good that man should be alone. I will make a, a, a helper comparable to him. One who corresponds to him in like kind. One on the same level as him. The command to women to submit in Ephesians chapter 5 uh, we talked about this last week. It's in the middle voice, which means it's something she's to choose to do. It's voluntary. It's not coerced. It's not forced. Uh, you know, uh, submission means to uh, kind of you know put yourself in an orderly rank, line yourself up under someone else's authority. So it really has to do with the way that God has ordered uh, things. And so, just to give you a, a couple of uh, big words that you may or may not ever want to use. Um, the viewpoint that men and women are equal, husbands and wives are equal, but have different roles, is called complementarianism. Okay, that's what we would espouse, what we believe at True Life. Uh, the viewpoint that there is no distinctions, and people no role distinctions, uh, some people take it to saying there's basically no distinctions to men and women between men and women at all. That's where you get into some of the gender issues today. But the, the term for it is egalitarianism, which is basically the philosophical basis of feminism. And so uh, those are two big two-bit words that may or not mean anything to you. But just so you'll know, that's the, the technical terms for what we're talking about. Complementarianism versus egalitarianism. Now, second, let me say something said again. Uh, said last week, remember that there are three aspects to the submission that is pictured here. First, there's submission to the Lord by both the husband and the wife. Second, verse 21, there's a mutual submission to one another. And maybe a good way to look at that, I've read uh, somebody describe it this way this past week. Think about a yield sign. 
And uh, the analogy that, uh, that he gave was like at one time driving out into the country, coming to a one-way bridge, and seeing a yield sign on it, uh, you know, on his end of it. And uh, you know, so he stopped, made sure nothing was coming, then he went. When he got to the other side, he saw on that side of it, there was a yield sign too. And the idea was, if both yielded, uh, you know, everybody's fine. If they didn't yield, you're going to have a head-on collision. And that's, I think, a pretty good analogy for marriage. Uh, when we yield to each other, we're safe. When neither one of us yields, you're about to have a head-on collision. So a lot of marriage is, is this mutual submission, but there's also this command in Ephesians 5.22, Ephesians 5.24, uh, that the wife is to uh, submit to her husband. And so there are some cases in which he leads and in which that's the case. And I'll just share again what Robin said to me. I shared this to you last week. She said, the conclusion I came to is if I submit to you, then you have to answer to God and I'm off the hook. Um, and so I think the way that this should generally look, it may vary some from couple to couple, but on a practical level, is that both in a Christian marriage, both the husband and the wife, are to submit to Christ, to be seeking Him individually and together. We're to yield to one another in personal matters as much as possible, seeking to meet each other's needs and compromising often. Marriage is often one big compromise. Uh, the husband is to love and serve his wife in a Christ-like manner while setting the lead in the home. He is seeking to do the will of God and lead his family to do uh, the same. Uh, basically, men, leadership is us going there first and then bringing our families along with us. That's the idea of this. He's to be providing for, protecting, and leading his family spiritually. Husbands and wives are to prayerfully discuss issues, to seek to make decisions together, but he may delegate some decisions to her or they may agree that some decisions belong to him. I mean, uh, you know, being a leader doesn't mean you make all the decisions. In fact, I would say in any realm of life, if you're leading and you're making all the decisions, you're a terrible leader. You're not actually leading at that point because, uh, you know, leading is bringing other people along in the process. You know, there may be things that she's better at than you that you're much better off if she is taking the lead in that uh, particular area. Um, if you can't reach a decision together, then though, I think, uh, based on what we're reading in this passage, that he should make the decision. He kind of gets the tie-breaking vote at that point because of what God says here. I think that's roughly, at least, like I say, may vary from couple to couple, what it looks like practically. So, that's once again, somewhat review, trying to put it in context. Now, let me say just kind of you know three or four things in particular to the women here. Okay, first, some common myths about submission. Okay, I want us to look at a list of some things that this does not mean. All right, it, it, first of all, it doesn't mean that women are to submit to men in general. Um, a man tried to tell Robin that one time, and that just absolutely did not fly anywhere. Um, I mean, this does not mean that a woman can't be independent or self-sufficient and still voluntarily, voluntarily choose to submit uh, to her husband. I promise you, Robin does not fall apart when I go to Honduras. She is uh, completely fine. So it doesn't mean that women are not to submit to men in general. It doesn't mean that the wife is in fear in any way or that the wife is less capable because she is a woman. Uh, I would say without any hesitation that my wife is all around uh, way more talented than I am. Sometimes people, as they get to know us, will say, uh, and they really don't know us yet if they're asking this question, but they'll say sometimes like, um, Jimmy, your whole family is uh, talented, uh, musically. Do you, you, you play music? And if anybody that's around that knows us just kind of laughs at that particular point in time. And uh, my answer is, and uh, my best talent is, I married well. Uh, <laughs> that actually wasn't a talent, though. That, that, was a, that was a grace, really. I was so lame that, uh, you know, Robin and I were hanging out as friends for like a month, but she actually had to give me her phone number to get me to ask her out. That's, that's, how, how, that's how lame uh, that, that, that I was. So uh, hopefully I've made some progress since then. But uh, probably, uh, 
any progress that I've made, you know, most all of it is Jesus and Robin. So it, it doesn't mean that your wife is inferior, less capable, anything uh, like that. It, it doesn't mean the wife's to be a silent partner. We'll talk more about this in a minute, but it so, certainly does not mean that the wife is to passively accept mistreatment. Uh, it does not mean that the wife is a slave. I, I think a lot of times um, where people struggle with this concept is like some legalistic aberrations of what the Scripture actually teaches that devolves into things like patri patriarchalism, you know, where everything is male-dominated, or, you know, the Bible doesn't actually teach some of the stereotypical gender roles that we have. Um, you know, I mean, and there's nothing, that's not, there's nothing wrong with that, but it's not like mandated either. So it's like, your husband cooks and he's a better cook than you. I mean, that's not like a biblical thing that the wife has to do all the cooking and, you know, all of those kind of stereotypical kind of things. There, there's nothing, that would be like something that someone's adding to uh, Scripture at that point in time. It doesn't mean that the wife's personality is to be squelched. It doesn't mean, and, and if you read some, you know, kind of hyper-fundamentalist stuff, they, it will, some of that literature will say some stuff along these lines. It, it, it doesn't mean that the wife's to treat her husband like he's God. She's submitting to God to follow Him, but, and, and I don't think there's anything about this that prevents the wife from working outside the home. I don't believe that's a biblical absolute. Uh, I think that's something you know each family has to decide for themselves. Now, we would affirm that motherhood is a primary calling for a, a wife, and if she's able to have children, I mean, Malachi 2, you know, part of God's purpose in marriage is to have godly offspring. But to say that she can never work outside the home, I think that is, you know, adding to Scripture. That would, you know, wouldn't be, not be some kind of biblical absolute. So, I think it's important that we understand that, you know, that's not the kind of thing, these, this list, that this is talking about. Now, let me pick up on one of the things in this list and say something that's really important. A wife's submission to her husband is not unlimited because his authority is delegated from God and therefore limited. Okay, now you need to listen very closely on this part. So the word everything in verse 24 may sound unlimited, but it's actually limited by the fact that the analogy is based on the headship of Jesus over the church. So the man's authority is limited under the authority of Christ. Does that make sense to everybody? Um, so this means that she can appeal to the higher authorities of God, government, and the church. Now, and what I'm going to say in this section, I know I'm going to open the door for, pe for people to, uh, th you know, we fall in the ditch on either side of the road. So sometimes, uh, you know, people fall in the ditch on the other side, on one side of the road of using Scripture to, you know, oppress women. Sometimes, though, uh, you know, what could happen here is someone could take one of these exceptions I'm giving and, and use that to try to, um, you know, not follow this in general. So don't fall in that ditch either. We're talking about genuine exceptions and not excuses so to disobey. But I want to give you six categories, paraphrased from someone named Stephen Tracy, about six instances where it would be acceptable, not only acceptable, really right, if these are genuine circumstances for a wife to not submit to her husband's leadership. Okay, everybody understand what I'm saying? This would be six exceptions, okay? Number one, if following his leadership would cause you to go against Scripture, you should say, I must obey God instead of man. So, like if your husband, uh, you know, told you in some way uh, to commit adultery, you know, through some deviant sexual act, or he wanted you to steal something, or uh, lie for him, or whatever. I mean, if, if something is, you know, going, clearly going against Scripture, you would be right to say, I have to follow God instead of you. A, a second way is being when following his leadership, if it would hurt your relationship with Jesus. So if your husband tells you you can't pray, you can't read the Bible, those kind of things, it, it would be right. To, I mean, I wouldn't flaunt it, but it would be right to still go ahead and pray and read the Bible and those kind of things. Now, if, if you're like, um, especially if your husband's not a Christian, if you're like, 
putting little Bible verses, taping it on his mirror and all these kind of things. And he wants you to stop that. Stop it. Okay, that's not going to hurt your relationship with Jesus. Right? Uh, we'll get to a verse about that in a minute. But uh, just don't, that's not what I'm talking about, okay? Uh, just don't nag him about it. Uh, so third, when, when following his leadership, would violate her conscience in some way. And, you know, if, if it feels wrong to you, feels like you're sinning, maybe an example would be is if he wanted uh, some kind of sexual act that feels shameful or sinful to you, you'd be right to say, no, let's not do that. Let's do this if it's violating your conscience in some way. When following his leadership would compromise the care or protection of the children, like, you know, he wants you to leave a small child alone or something like that. It would be right uh, to resist that. When following his leadership would enable her husband to sin, it would be right to resist that. If your husband says, go buy drugs for me, uh, maybe that's an extreme example, but you would be right to say no. And then when following his leadership would subject her to physical, sexual, or emotional abuse. And so if, if your husband uh, is physically, sexually abusing you, or anybody is, uh, you would be right to go to the government, to, and to, to go to a counselor, this kind of thing, you know, to report that to law enforcement. You are not required to subject yourself to that. If your husband is emotionally abusing you, you'd be right to come to the elders of the church and ask them uh, to intervene in that situation. Uh, if it's genuine emotional abuse, which it really is. Now, there's also, that's a trend today. And some people, you know, will read about it on the internet and will use that uh, to make, you know, an issue or, you know, to blame it on that. Or maybe it's a two way street. So, you know, I would give that caveat when it comes to that. But, uh, Scripture does not require a woman to sub or anybody, child, man, whoever, to submit him or herself to abusive behavior. So understand there are these caveats when, uh, when we talk about this. Okay? Number five. That's the last statement really I want to give you here. Is, and it's this. Submission is spiritual in nature because ultimately this is between a woman and God. Notice what verse 22 says again. Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. Now, let me make a few statements to help us understand that, hopefully. So, number one, submission is ultimately an act of obedience and submission to the Lordship of Jesus. In other words, it flows out of your walk with Christ. Number two, though, and I think it flows out of that, this means that you can't be unsubmissive to your husband and submitted to God at the same time. 1 Peter 3.1 says, The wives likewise be submissive to your own husbands. Even if some do not obey the word, they without a word may be won by the conduct of their wives when they observe your chaste conduct accompanied by fear. So even if your husband's not a Christian, or he says he's a Christian, and he's not living for the Lord, uh, you know, within those parameters that we talked about, you're still to follow his leadership, and it says to win him without a word. You're not going to win your husband by preaching to him. You're going to win your husband, or God will win him by example and those kind of things. That's what that uh, text is, is saying, because whether it is or not, men do tend to take things as nagging. And so a lot of times what you say to him is going to be counterproductive. And so he says, win him by your example, by you know, honoring his leadership. Uh, but you, know, you can't be submitted to Christ and unsubmissive to your husband at the same time. Because it's a clear-cut command of Scripture. I think this means sometimes uh, submitting to your husband is trusting God with your husband. It's like, I don't know if he can really pull this off or not, but Lord, I'm going to obey you. And remember, trust is when we actually take steps of obedience. Remember that the ultimate purpose of our submission is to please the Lord. Just like we talked about last week, men, the ultimate purpose of our leadership is to please the Lord, that we have to look beyond just our spouse. The ultimate purpose of your submission is to please the Lord. Why is this part, that, that principle, that part of it so important? Because 
Here, here's this. Sometimes, you know, we, we teach or you hear people teach in, in, you know, the Bible like, if you do this, this, and this, everything's going to work out perfectly and it's going to be happily ever after. That's not necessarily how it works in the real world. You may love your wife like Christ loved the church and she may respond to you terribly. Still do it as unto the Lord. You may be submitting to your husband and he may not be leading uh, very well at all. Do it as unto the Lord. That's the idea of it. And, and remember that submission is following the example of Jesus. We talked about this last week. In the Trinity, the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit are equal. But Jesus laid all of that aside and He came from heaven to earth and He lived as a man. And think about it. In the Garden of Gethsemane, when He was wrestling with going to the cross, He said, not my will be done, but your will be done. What greater example of submission, of humility, has there ever been than that? Let me give you an illustration of this. It comes from a book called The Meaning of Marriage by Pastor Tim Keller and his wife Kathy. And it's actually Kathy writing in, in this section. And, you know, if, if you don't know, who, I mean, Tim Keller is a very well-known author. He was pastor for a long time, planted Redeemer Presbyterian Church in New York City. And, and I think I probably need to say this just in background to get the impact of what she's saying here. I mean, uh, Redeemer has been one of the most important, influential churches of the latter part of the 20th and first part of the 21st century. Now, this is not just you know, because of them, but studies show that when they moved to New York to plant Redeemer, less than 1% of Manhattan was evangelical. Now about 5% of Manhattan is evangelical. And that's not just about Redeemer, but by the fact that they've planted hundreds of churches in New York City out of Redeemer. Why do we have such an emphasis on church planning here? Because I, I think you, you ha that's how you church a city, how you church an area through starting new churches. And, and so here, here's what she said. In the late 1980s, our family was comfortably situated in a very livable suburb, suburb of Philadelphia where Tim held a full-time position as a professor. Then he got an offer to move to New York City to plan a new church. He was excited by the idea, but I was appalled. Raising our three wild boys in Manhattan was unthinkable. And not only that, but almost no one who knew anything about Manhattan thought that the project would be successful. I also knew that this would not be something that Tim would be able to do as a nine-to-five job. It would absorb the whole family and nearly all of our time. It was clear to me that I want, that Tim wanted sorry, it was clear to me that Tim wanted to take the call, but I had serious doubts that it was the right choice. I expressed my strong doubts to Tim, who responded, Well, if you don't want to go, then we won't go. However, I replied, Oh, no, you don't. You aren't putting this decision on me. That's abdication. If you think this is the right thing to do, then exercise your leadership and make the choice. It's your job to break this logjam. It's my job to wrestle with God until I can joyfully support your call. I think that's a pretty good synopsis of what we've talked about the last two weeks. She says, Tim made the decision to come to New York City and plant Redeemer Presbyterian Church. The whole family, my sons included, consider it one of the most truly manly things he ever did because he was quite scared, but he felt a call from God. And think about what's come out of this, this decision. At this point, Tim and I were both submitting to roles that we were not perfectly comfortable with. But it is clear that God worked in us and through us when we accepted our gender roles as a gift from the designer of our hearts. Submission is a spiritual issue. Now, let me close with this. You know, the, the whole idea of this um, you know, marriage series is, has been to expound Ephesians 5, 22 through 33 with so that's kind of limiting it there's obviously things i could talk about beyond marriage or, or beyond this passage but uh wanted to be really practical uh, i hope it's felt that way but i, I want to end this particular message by addressing three practical issues that go along with this general subject that we're talking about okay so this would be a question that often comes up with this does this apply to areas outside of marriage like work or like elected offices so 
um, like at work, can um, females be like over, can they be the boss of males? And I would say the answer to that would be absolutely yes. I mean, this is, not, this is talking about a specific area within marriage. Uh, certainly, it would include things like equal pay for equal work, uh, you know, those kind of things that have been an issue in, in our society. But, I mean, I would have no issue, uh, you know, with a female being my boss if I was out, you know, working in uh, the, the, the world somewhere. I, you know, Jessica, my assistant, and my nickname for her is Boss Lady. Uh, and it, it's, it's, it's really, it's an opposite nickname because she's so sweet and, and, and kind, and she's really the opposite of that. Although every once in a while, she has to keep me on track. But, you know, if we were outside the church and she was really my boss, I would have no problem with that. So, you know, what about elected offices? Sometimes people ask the question, well, could a female be president? So this would be my short answer to that. 2044, Lily Inman for president. <laughs> that, 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 would be, that would be my answer to that. Okay, so um, I mean that. I'm being serious about that. So um, second question would be, how does this apply in churches? You know, are, are there limits within churches? Okay, and I'm really going to pretty much focus it on one area because I think, you know, there's some areas where churches are going to come down different places, that kind of thing. But at True Life, we believe that men and women are equally gifted and women should serve in multiple ways in churches. Not a question of talent, like I said before, not a question of spiritual gifts. I believe, in fact, women should serve in every way that is not specifically disallowed by Scripture. You know, if you look at our staff, we have eight people on staff right now. We have four women and we have four men. Um, however, we are complementarian. And so, you know, in, while we believe men and women are equally spiritually gifted, but we believe there are some differences and, and distinction in office when it comes to being a pastor. So at, at True Life, and I understand this is controversial to some people, uh, I mean, probably over the years when we've had people uh, you know, go through the membership class and not actually join. Probably the second most common reason, the first most common reason is people just don't want to make a commitment. The second most common reason has been this particular issue. Uh, w one time, uh, we actually had a group of students, female students from Carson Newman, walk out in the middle of the class over this particular issue. But we believe that, that uh, in, in churches, men, that men are called to be pastors, elders or elders, whichever term you want to use. You say, why? Well, I'll just give you four basic reasons because I don't have much time. First of all, uh, inf the, by inference, we believe that male leadership in the home extends to male leadership in the church for, to provide men an example for leading in the home. Second reason would be model. None of the apostles or pastors named in the New Testament were females. The third reason would be role. 1 Timothy uh, 2.12 says, Paul says, I don't permit a woman to uh, teach or exercise authority over a man. Well, what's the two primary roles of an elder? To teach uh, the Word of God in an authoritative way to the congregation and to lead in a biblically authoritative way the entire church. And, and so, uh, you know, I don't see how then a woman could fit in that role. And the third reason then, or the fourth reason, sorry, would be by qualification. 1 Timothy 3, uh, 2, and talking about the qualifications for pastors, says that a pastor is to be the husband of one wife, or the only other way to translate it is one woman man. Uh, but there is no way to make it say that like the wife of one husband. I mean, that's what it says in the Greek. And, you know, a lady, however gifted she is, cannot pull off being the husband of one wife. And so for those basic reasons, we believe that, uh, you know, the office of pastor is restricted uh, to men. But, you know, like I say, we believe that women are equally gifted and should serve in every possible way in the church. And so, one last question then, because I'm uh, basically out of time. And, and maybe this relates just loosely, but I, I think it relates to the section uh, where I was talking about being, uh, you know, what are, what are exceptions to this. And that is, what about the Me Too movement? And, and I think it's important to say something about, because something that has bothered me, honestly, Sometimes I hear Christians 
criticize this. And it baffles me, frankly. Um, now, I understand maybe there can be some excess. I understand uh, maybe that, you know, some people would go a little too far and you need to have, you know, proper burdens of truth and evidentiary kind of things and those kind of things. But uh, as Christians, as Bible-believing Christians, how could we not support something that is both a justice issue and a mercy issue? I mean, if anybody is going to stand with and for victims, it ought to be the church. This ought to be the safest place in the world where somebody could come and be open and share that this has happened to me and be a place, be a healing balm for people. And so, you know, if you've been abused in some way, I want you to know we have a counselor on staff. Uh, you could come to one of our pastors. You could, uh, you know, talk to your small group leader. And there are people who will care for you, who will love you, who will guide you, who will help you. Uh, you know, we want to be a place, I mean, you know, we, we can't guarantee this is never going to happen in the church, but why do we have so many safeguards in place when it uh, comes to, you know, working with kids, when it comes to working with teenagers, that kind of thing? It's because we want to do everything we can to prevent this from ever happening on our watch. It is a terrible evil. Really, I, I think uh, fu feminists and fundamentalists, this ought to be one area they ought to be able to get together on and, and, and work together on, you know, working for women's rights, uh, you know, working against abuse, pornography, human trafficking, abortion, because abortion is a terrible evil against females. And so, you know, we want to stand you know, with victims and stand for what's right and to stand against people being mistreated in, in any way. And, and, and once again, please do not use the Bible and try to turn it into something where as a book that, that is oppressive towards women, that, you know, is just patriarchal and, you know, putting men above women and letting men uh, mistreat women in any way. All of this is defined by, rooted in, grounded in the command to love. And so, men, not just with our wives, but in how we relate to the women around, other women around us, we ought to lead the way and, and model for the world, I mean, Christian gentlemen. I think chivalry should not be dead. But we, we certainly ought to uh, in, in our homes with our wives, loving, Christ-like servant leaders. That's what we're called to. Ladies, are you following your husband's leadership in a biblical way? If you're single, if you're dating somebody, if you're, if you're engaged, you're thinking about getting married, a question you ought to be asking yourself is, could I, can I follow this guy's leadership, do I think, for the rest of my life? Because if you're a Christian and you're living your life under the authority of Scripture, that's, what you're, that's the position you're putting yourself in. And, and that's a, a way more important question than how cute he's going to look in the wedding pictures and, and, and all this kind of stuff. Can you really? Is he a man that you can follow for the rest of your life? And for all of us, we're called to follow Scripture, to follow God's design, to conform ourselves to His pattern and not the pattern of this world in this area in every other area of our lives. Teenagers, as you date, as you think about the future, all these kind of things, you have to make a decision. I'd encourage you to make a decision now to develop some convictions. Are you going to do this God's way? Are you going to do this the world's way? Are you going to listen to Scripture? Are you going to listen to your parents? Are you going to listen to youth leaders, pastors who are trying to lead you in the right way? Or are you going to follow what everybody on Instagram and all these other things say? Are you going to follow what the Word of God says? Develop some convictions now because it will save you a lot of heartache in the future. Let's pray. Lord God, I pray male or female, adult, teenager, whatever age we are, wherever we are in our lives, that you would help us to submit to you, to trust you, and to follow your word. Lord, I, I pray, Jesus, there are people here who don't know you as Lord, or maybe think that they do, but they've been just going their own way. I pray right now that you convict them and draw them to yourself. But Lord, give us the grace to live this out in our lives. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.